Last week we looked and started looking into the doctrine of the Trinity, and last week I showed <clears throat> that the, the Trinity, uh, that our God, is a God who is three persons, yet one God. He's the Father, the Word, which is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And <clears throat> we looked at extensively how uh, the Father's God, which was pretty obvious, how Jesus Christ is God, which we'll get into more when we get into the deity of Christ here in a week or so. And then I spent a lot of time talking about how the Holy Ghost is God. So I proved that each person of the Trinity is God. And now what I want to do today is I want to show you that Jesus and the Father are one. I want to show you that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one. And then we want to look at some references to the Trinity in the Old Testament and then some references to the Trinity in the New Testament. So we started off with the, the, the most important thing to establish that each of them are God. Then establish, Now we'll establish that each of them are one with each other, proving that, that God is a trinity of three persons, one God. And then we'll just look at a bunch of examples of the trinity, both Old and New Testament. A lot of people think that the idea of the trinity came along in the New Testament. This is just some New Testament creation. The apostles came up with this crazy idea. But if they did, they somehow went back and revised the entire Old Testament or something because the whole Old Testament shows that God is a triune God as well. Like these crazy people that try to say that, that the New Testament writers came up with the idea that Jesus is God. Dan Brown in his uh, Da Vinci Code. That was the whole premise of the book, that, that, they, that the New Testament writers basically made Jesus God. Well, that's funny because the Old Testament declares explicitly over and over and over again that the Messiah would be God. So that just takes the legs out from that argument. So first of all, let's look at how Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, these simple words, I and my Father are one. In what way are they one that he's saying in this, te in this context here? Are they just one in opinion or are they one you know, in, in some other way? No, they're actually one God. If you look at what he says there, just look at what he, they, they both do the same thing. In verse 28, he says, And I give unto them, that is the sheep, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Jesus and the Father, as God, both have their hands on his sheep, and nobody can pluck them out of either of their hands. And the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying here. When he said, I and my Father are one, they knew that he was claiming to be God. How do I know that? Well, look at the next verse. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. Which of, these, which of those works do ye stone me? For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy... And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. They knew when he said, I and my Father are one, that means that he's God. They understood it. Jehovah's Witnesses don't get it, but the Jews got it, and they tried to kill him for it. This isn't the only time. Remember John chapter 8, we saw that last time. He said, before Abraham was, I am, and they took up stones to kill him. So you can pretty much figure that, that uh, every time that they're trying to kill him, it's usually when he's claiming to be God. They don't, they don't like that. Look at John 14 and verse 9. Remember when Philip asked Jesus to show us the Father. They want to see what God looks like. And here's what Jesus tells them. John 4 tells Philip, John 14 and verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? If you've seen Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father because Jesus and the Father are one. Remember, Jesus is the express image of God's person. We read in Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Okay, so let's look at the fact that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one then. And last time, I spent a lot more time proving that the Holy Ghost was God, because that, I think that point is neglected a lot of times. This time, I'm going to spend more time showing you that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one than I did showing you that Jesus and God the Father are one. Jesus said, first of all, I have several, several different proofs for this, but first of all, Jesus said that he would send the Comforter to the disciples who was the Holy Ghost. He said that in John 14 
verses 16 and 17. You don't even need to turn the page. We're on the same page as we left off. John 14, 16 and 17 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, ye may abide, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So the, that, this is who the comforter is. He defines him as the Spirit of truth or the Holy Spirit. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus says, I'm going to send you another comforter, and it's going to be the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. But then in the next verse, look at what Jesus says. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So he says, I'm going to send you a comforter, which is the spirit of truth. And then he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. What's that tell you? That Jesus and the spirit of truth are one, one in the same God. When the spirit of truth comes to you, it's the same as Jesus coming unto you because they're both God. And Jesus would come to us through the spirit of truth. Just brings to mind a thought where it says that in 1 Peter 3 that Jesus, um, through the spirit, I forget how it says it there, he, through the spirit, spake, uh, preached unto the people who were long time disobedient in the, in the days of Noah. So anyway, just another thought that Jesus does things through the spirit. So there's no problem here. It makes perfect sense if you understand 1 John 5, 7, that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I'll be making reference to John 5, 7, 1 John 5, 7, many times throughout this study. Well, the next proof that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one is that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, and that is the same as the, same as the Spirit of Christ. And it makes sense if Christ is, is God, then the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, because Christ is God. So this is a proof that Christ is God, and it's also a proof that the Spirit of God is one with the Spirit of Christ. And I will show you that momentarily here. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now here's the evidence that you're in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, that's the evidence that you're in the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. You're born again. Okay? Let's look at the second half of the verse. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Paul's saying the same thing again in different words. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. You're not Christ's if you don't have the Spirit of Christ. Having the Spirit of Christ is the evidence of belonging to Christ. But look at the two different phrases that he uses to describe the same thing. In the first part, he says, If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. In the second part, he says, If you have not the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are the same thing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit here. Call the Spirit of God, call the Spirit of Christ. Let me show you another verse. Philippians 1 and verse 19. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 19 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So there the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And look at one more, 1 Peter 1 and verse 11. 1 Peter 1 and verse 11 says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, that is in the prophets, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So Peter says here that the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets, teaching them, showing them, signifying through them the sufferings of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. And if you compare that with 2 Peter 1, in verse 21, we'll see that the Spirit of God was the one that was in the prophets, allowing them to prophesy, giving them their prophecy. 2 Peter 1, in verse 21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of Christ was in them, prophesying of the sufferings of Christ. You see that? The Spirit of Christ and the Holy Ghost are the same thing. 
Now, we're told in Romans 8, in verse 9, that the Spirit of God dwells in the elect. We just read that. We're going to read a couple more verses there, too. Romans chapter 8, in verse 9, the Spirit of God dwells in the elect. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Dwell in you. So the Spirit of God dwells in us. But then we're told in verse 10, in the next verse, that Christ dwells in us. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So in verse 9, he says the Spirit of God dwells in you. In verse 10, he says, but if Christ dwells in you. Put it together. Christ and the Spirit of God are one. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, Christ dwells in you, because Christ and the Spirit of God are one. We're also told in Galatians 4, 6, that the Spirit of God's Son dwells in our hearts. Look at Galatians 4 and verse 6. Galatians 4, 6. It says, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So God made us, God chose us to be sons. Jesus died for us that we might be sons. And then God sends forth the Spirit of his Son, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. So it says that the Spirit of his Son's in our hearts. It says that Christ dwells in our hearts. Christ and the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the Son are one. Here's the third proof for you. The Holy Spirit, we're told, makes intercession for us. Back to Romans chapter 8 again. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This says that the Spirit of God makes intercession for us. But then we read just a few verses later, down in verse 34, that Jesus Christ makes intercession for us. Romans 8 and verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We're told earlier the Spirit of God makes intercession for us. Now we're told that Christ makes intercession for us. Well, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. When you see this, the, the persons of the Godhead doing the same thing, you can conclude that they are one God. And we're going to see many different examples of that coming up here. Here's one more for you. Jesus Christ, he gave the revelation to John in the book of Revelation, and he gave instruction to the seven churches in Asia, messages to them. Let's look at Revelation 1 and verse 1. I want to show you that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to show you something neat. Revelation 1 and verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now turn to verses 17 through 20. You're going to see here that Jesus is going to give instruction in this revelation to these seven churches in Asia. Uh, revelation 1, 17 through 20. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is when John saw Jesus, Jesus in his glorified state in heaven. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Clearly, the Lord Jesus Christ we're talking about here. First and the last, he was, the live, or he was dead, and now he liveth. I don't know any other being in the universe that would, describe, that would be described with words such as that besides the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. See, Revel uh, that's just a side note, but Revelation covers things past, present, and future, you notice. A lot of people like to look at it like it only covers things that are in the future, but it actually covers past, present, and future. Write the things which thou hast seen, past, the things which are, present, and the things which shall be, hereafter, future. Anyway, 
Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the se- and, the, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he tells them to send a message to these churches. Now this message would be from the Son of God. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 18. He says there to the church in Thyatira, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, Thyatira, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame, like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. So there's no doubt about it. The Son of God is the one that is speaking to these churches, right? Okay, but who does the Son of God say is giving the message to the churches? Just a little bit later. Look in verse, uh, Revelation 2 and verse 29. To the same church, mind you, Thyatira, that he said, The Son of God saith these things. In verse 29 it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It says the Son of God saying unto the churches, and then hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Jesus and the Spirit are one. No contradiction there, right? Look at Revelation 3 and verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. The message was given to the churches by God the three in one. The Son and the Holy Ghost, in this case, are giving the message. So, let me just put this all, put the proof that you've heard this morning and last Sunday into one statement. If, number one, there is only one God, And that is true. I proved there's only one God. Two, the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the Word, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost are all God. I proved that. Showed each individually are God. The Father is God. Jesus Christ is God. The Word is God. The Word and Jesus Christ are the same thing. And the Holy Spirit is God. And they are all one with each other, number three. Therefore, God is three persons, yet one God. Or in other words, He's a trinity or a triune God. Let me say it one more time. Number one, there's only one God. Number two, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are all three God, which has been proven. Number three, they are all one with each other. Therefore, God is three persons, yet one God. He's a triune God or a trinity. So there it's, I think, been proved. Not I think, I mean, I know. It's been proved irrefutably from the Scriptures that God is a trinity, three persons, yet one God. People take up, they take issue with that usage of the word person, but I already showed you in Hebrews 1 and verse 3 that it said Jesus is the express image of God's person. God is called a person. Like it or not, whether you like the definition, I don't really care, but that's a valid word to describe the persons of the Godhead as person because God, it says, is a person. Somebody from YouTube was just making a comment about that the other day. That one I was smart enough not to respond to. For some reason, I'm not smart enough not to respond to all of them. I'm trying to work on that. It's so hard. It's like what Jeremiah says, his word was in me as a fire burning in my bosom and I could not stay. Sometimes I just can't help myself. And I keep telling myself, rebuke not a fool lest you receive a blot and so on. I mean, it's just, it's stupid, but I, sometimes I just can't help myself. It is. It's an addiction. Well, we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but at some point when you're arguing with idiots, and when I say idiots, I really mean idiots. I'm talking about atheists here who, who believe that the most highly complex machine in the universe was spontaneously generated by natural processes. So we're talking about idiots here, so it doesn't make sense to argue with idiots. But I'm, I'm on my soapbox. It's just been fresh in my mind. Anyway... All right, so let's look at references to two or more persons of the Trinity in the Old Testament. So we'll start back in the Old Testament, first of all. And I think there's a bunch of neat things back here I want to show you. And then we'll go back or go forward to the New Testament. So first of all, back in the Old Testament, God is referred to both in the singular and in the plural many different times. This shows both the oneness and the threeness of God. Now, we know from other places that God is three. 
So that's why I say the oneness and the threeness of God. If he's referred to simply in the plural, it could be the oneness and the twoness, or the oneness and the fourness, or the oneness and the tenthness. But since we know from other places God is three in one, we see that these plural references to God show us the oneness and the threeness of God. Turn with me, first of all, back there to Genesis chapter 1, to the very beginning. You can't even get out of the first chapter of the Bible before you find out that God is three in one. As a matter of fact, you can't even get through the first three verses of the Bible. But we'll get to that in just a second. But get to, go, to John, go to Genesis 1 and verse 26. I want you to notice some very interesting language here. Genesis 1, 26. <clears throat> it says, And God said, Let us... Now that should make you pause right there. God said, Let us... Huh? I thought God was one. God said, let us make man in our image. Some people might think he's got a split personality or something. What's going on here? Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God said, let us make man in our image. This clearly tells us that God, there's something about God that is a plurality. Because he's using a plural pronoun. Us and our are plural pronouns. I think everybody knows that. But look at what the next verse says in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He says first, let's make him in our image. And then it says he created him in his image. That's singular. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he, not they, created he, them. God is referred to as he and his there, which are singular. But this is no problem, and this makes perfect sense if you understand that God is a trinity. Three persons, one God. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are one. Now some people, and I'm going to refrain from doing this just on principle, I'm not saying, you know, whatever, that's fine, but some people would go back and say that the word for God there is Elohim, and it means at least three mighty ones in the Hebrew, and that's fine. I don't know Hebrew, like I said, so I'm not going, don't worry, I'm not going on another rant or anything, but just on principle, I don't need to go to the Hebrew, and this just shows you right there. I mean, all you need is an English Bible, and I'd rather prove to you my doctrine from an English King James Bible. I'm just reading you words in English. You can read them in English. You can get out an English dictionary. You can Look up words in your own language, and I don't need to take you to any other document. I don't need to take you to any other language or anything. Anybody in this room can understand this. You don't need to know another language. So just on principle, I'm not, I don't go there. I'll prove my doctrine from the English. Now, when God banished Adam from the garden, it said that the man has become, of one, of, has become one of us. Look at Genesis 3 and verse 22. Genesis 3.22. After the fall of man, God's still a trinity. Imagine that. Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. He's not talking about the angels either. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he, see that personal pronoun, that singular pronoun? So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God said he's become as one of us, and then it says he drove him out. God's plural, God's singular. God is three in one. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You're going to keep hearing that verse over and over again. It's interesting that in that uh, little pamphlet I was telling you about that I read in the Trinitarian Bible Society, I don't know why, and they are King James people too, they did not use 1 John 5, 7 one time in that pamphlet. The, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They did not use that verse one time in their pamphlet on the Trinity. And I don't know why. I could see if maybe it was a, a society that used one of these other modern perversions that don't have that verse in there. But I thought maybe even at the very end they would at least use the verse or something. You know, to, They're maybe not using it as a proof text, but just 
I don't know. Anyway, I just I don't know what, what the reason for that was, but I thought that was very strange to, t- to not use the most clear verse that states the doctrine. But, but anyway, that's just something interesting to think about. All right, so then we go here to Genesis chapter 11. We get to the Tower of Babel, and God is still a trinity. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7. God sees these people, the people, they decided that they needed to build themselves a tower to make a name for themselves. They didn't want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth, so they're going to build a tower. God says, all right, you're going to build a tower, I'm going to scatter you abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Talk about getting it backwards. But in verse 7 there, the Lord says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. There are gods of plurality again. But look at verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence. It doesn't say the Lord and the angels. It says the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. God says, let us go down, plural pronoun. And then the Lord goes down and scatters them. Singular. God is singular. God is plural. God is three in one or one in three. When God needed a prophet to proclaim his word, he said to Isaiah, Whom shall I send? Look at Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Isaiah has many references to the Trinity. I will show you some of them as we go through this today. Isaiah 6 and verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? There is one verse that has God as a singular and a plural. Whom shall I send, singular, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So there's no contradiction here, no problem, because God's a trinity. God is a three in one. So God can say us or God can say I, either one. He's three in one. Let me give you another example of the trinity. Turn back there to Genesis 15 and verse 1. We'll see here that it says, The word of the Lord came unto Abraham. Now I'm going to show you who that word of the Lord was. Genesis 15 and verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying... It didn't say the Lord came unto him, saying. It says the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. The word of the Lord is who is saying. The the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Let me show you here that the word of the Lord was the Lord God Jehovah. In verse 7, Genesis 15, 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur, the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. So the word of the Lord comes unto Abraham, and that word of the Lord says, I am the Lord. Now we know that Jesus Christ is called the word of God, right? Look in Revelation 19 and verse 13. So the word of the Lord and the word of God, these are synonymous terms, obviously. And here we have Jesus Christ, who is called the word of God. Now, who do you might think it was there in Revelation 15 who came to Abraham? The word of the Lord, the word of God. The word made flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. Revelation 19 and verse 13, it says, And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously. King of kings, Lord of lords, verse 16. He's called the Word of God, or the Word of the Lord, in other words. We know that Jesus Christ, He is the Word. He is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the Word who is God. Let me give you another example. Later on in Genesis 18, the Lord appears to Abraham, this time as three men. Now, if this is not a a type and a shadow of the Trinity, I don't know what would be. Three men come unto Abraham, and it was the Lord appearing to him. Genesis 18 and verse 1 through 2. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent 
in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted, or he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So the Lord appears to him, and Abraham sees three men standing there. The Lord appears as three men. Now, why would God appear to Abraham as three men? Maybe because God is a trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But there's more. Let me show you. So, these three men there are referred to in the plural. It says, they asked Sarah, or they asked Abraham where Sarah was. Look at verse 9. It says, And they said unto him, that is the three men, they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said. So here, they said, Where is Sarah? And next, in verse 10, And he said. See, once again, God being referred to as plural and singular. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard, and Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, not a good idea, don't laugh at God, saying, I, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure in my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Shall I, shall I of a certainty bear a child which am old? Saying, Shall I of a certainty bear a child when I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return. This is the Lord speaking, the Lord Jehovah, all in caps. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. You see, when these three men appeared and they were speaking to Abraham, and it says, and he said, certainly I'm going to return unto thee at the time of life. This is the Lord speaking. The Lord is saying this. And Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 9 as the Lord saying it. Romans chapter 9, I think it's in verse 8. Verse 9, pardon me. So here the Lord appears as three men, and then the Lord gives this blessed promise to Abraham that he's going to have a son. Typifying that the Lord is a three-in-one God. Then the Lord appears to Lot as two angels. Look at Genesis 19, the next chapter. Genesis 19 and verse 1. It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. When, notice that they didn't rebuke him for bowing down and worshiping them, these angels. Neither did the three men that Abraham bowed down and worshipped. It's because it was God, or a manifestation of God, anyway. So Lot sees these two angels that come unto him, he bows down and worships them. And then after nearly getting molested by some Sodomites, the angels say that they are going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 13. Uh, Genesis 19 and verse 13. It says, For we will destroy this place. Let me tell you what, if I was an angel and some Sodomite tried to come in there and sodomize me, I'd be ready to destroy the place too. I wouldn't blame them one bit. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So they say, we're going to destroy this place. These two angels say, we are going to destroy this place. But let's see who destroys the place. It says there, look at what it says in, in verse 24. This is some very curious language. Verse 24, it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. The Lord rains fire and brimstone from the Lord. Here are two angels on the ground, on the earth, saying, we are going to destroy this place. And it says, the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord. You think, well, how does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Two of the members of the Godhead are standing on earth saying, we're going to destroy this place. And the Lord on earth, in the form of those two angels, rains fire and brimstone down from the Lord in heaven. Three in one. Two of them on earth, one of them in heaven. The Lord raining fire down from the Lord. So maybe it was the Word and the Holy Ghost that were manifest as those two angels, calling it down from the Father in heaven, more than likely. Now all three persons of the Godhead also took part in the creation of the universe. 
Turn back there to Genesis 1 and verse 1. Like I said, the first three verses of the Bible show us the Trinity in, in shadow, obviously. I mean, it's not plainly, it's not 1 John 5, 7, uh, you know, in the Genesis 1, 1, but it, it's, uh, it's there. So you got, first of all, God in the beginning. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So there's the first person, God the Father. We're told in James 1 and verse 17 that God is the Father of lights. And what does God go on to say? Let there be light. Four days later, God creates the stars and the sun and the moon. He creates the lights. He's the Father of lights. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the Father. Then you have the Spirit of God, verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you get the Father in verse 1. You get the Spirit of God in verse 2. Now we're told here that the Spirit of God uh, is, He took part in the creation, that the heavens were made by God's breath, and the Holy Spirit is likened unto God's breath. Let me show you that. Look in Psalm 33 in verse 6. So this just tells us in Genesis 1-2 that the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, but if you put a few other verses together, you can see that the Spirit of God was the creator of the universe. Psalm 33 and verse 6. It says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. You remember what Jesus said to the disciples in John 20 and verse 22? He said, He breathed on them, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. John 20 and verse 22 says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is symbolized by God's breath. It says, By God's breath were the heavens made. The Holy Spirit is God who is the creator of the universe. So we got God the Father in Genesis 1.1. We got the Spirit of God in verse 2. And then we have the Word of God in Genesis 1.3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, there's God's word. And somebody might say, well, that doesn't mean anything. But when you compare it with the New Testament, and you see that it says that the heavens were framed by the word of God, when it says that all things were made by him, that is, by the word, then you see, ah, I see the word, I see the second person of the Trinity right here in type and shadow in Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Turn with me to John chapter 1, 1 through 3. I want to show you that the Word of God is the one who created all things. Genesis, not Genesis, John 1, 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It kind of sounds like in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's a very similar language, isn't it? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This is why I say that the second person of the Trinity is back there in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. It sounds almost the same. Basically, it's saying, in the beginning, the Word created the heavens and the earth. That's basically what John 1, 1 through 3 is saying, in other words. Now, of course, we know in verse 14 that the Word was made flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we're told that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world. Look at Ephesians 3 and verse 9, if you have a King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, go to sleep for a minute. You can pick up the next point because this, this verse isn't going to help you any. Ephesians 3 and verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God created all things by Jesus Christ. The NIV omits that phrase, by Jesus Christ. It just says God created all things. It takes away from the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also look over a couple of pages in Colossians 1 and verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. Now here, if you look in the context, we're talking about God's Son in verse 13. He delivered us and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. So he's talking about the Son of God Verse 16, for by him, that is by the Son of God, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, 
visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. If you don't get this this time around, you'll get it here in a week or two because I'm going to be talking about Jesus Christ being God and the creator of all things and all different, a whole bunch of different reasons why Jesus is God. Let me give you another example of the Trinity in the Old Testament. In Psalm 45, God is said to have anointed God. Doesn't make much sense to anoint yourself. It'd be like giving yourself a, you know, a degree or something. Not really worth much. But if you're God, and God is three persons, well, then one person can anoint another person, right? Look in Psalm, Psalm 45. I think that's how some of these clowns out there got their degree. I think they probably conferred it upon themselves. Or out of a Cracker Jack box or something like that. Well, it's kind of like these honorary degrees, you know, these honorary doctorates. I mean, I, don't, I would be ashamed to put, you know, Ph.D. at the end of my name if I was awarded an honorary doctorate. Honorary doctorate just means fake doctorate. You didn't do anything. They just gave you a doctorate because you're a nice guy. Psalm 45, 6 through 7. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He's talking to God. He says, Thy throne, O God, is forever. And then he says, God anointed thee. God anointed God. How does God anoint God? Well, if God is the Father, the Word, and Holy Ghost, God can anoint God. The Father can anoint God. The Word with the Holy Ghost. Isn't that neat? The Apostle Paul explains to us that we're talking about the Son of God here in Hebrews 1 in verse 8 and 9. It's pretty obvious what's being spoken of here anyway, but it is nice when an Apostle will just tell you plainly. Now what most people do, I shouldn't say most people, but what some people do, then they go to the words of the apostle, and then they directly contradict it and, and interpret the Old Testament passage the way that they want to interpret it and, and uh, clearly say the apostles didn't know what they were talking about. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scep a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, this anointing, you might ask, when did this take place? When was Jesus anointed by God? Well, we're told in the New Testament, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost. Or, I'm sorry, with the Holy Ghost, not by the Holy Ghost. Look in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Acts 10, 38. Let me show you where God anointed God, where the Father anointed the Word. Acts 10, 38. Peter's preaching here to Cornelius and his family, and he says how God, this is what John the Baptist preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, scepter of righteousness, scepter of thy kingdom. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The oil of gladness is the Holy Spirit. That's when God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, okay, but when did that happen? When did God, the Father, anoint Jesus with the Holy Spirit? Look no further than Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. Matthew 3 and verse 16. Here is when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost. This is when Jesus was baptized, obeying the commandment of the gospel. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. There is when God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. I'll give you another proof back there in the Old Testament. All three persons of the Trinity are mentioned in Isaiah 59, 19 through 20. Now this, I wouldn't say is a proof, it's definitely not a proof text. Now we're getting more into just reference text. We're seeing some verses where all three members of the Trinity are referenced together, not necessarily saying they're all God and they're all one and so on. So I went from the stronger proofs and now I'm just getting down into the reference texts. 
Sometimes it's nice to start with the reference text and then build them up and make the case stronger and stronger and stronger. Sometimes it's just good to start out with the strongest ones and then give supporting documentation. Just depends what kind of a mood I'm in, I suppose. Isaiah 59 and verses 19 through 20. It says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Let me tell you what, it's not a new American standard either. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. There's the Holy Ghost. There's the there's third person. Verse 20, and the Redeemer. Who do you suppose the Redeemer might be? Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. There's the second person of the Trinity. We're going in reverse order. Third person, the Spirit of God. Second person, the Redeemer. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Number three, the Father. The Holy Ghost, the Word, and the Father, and these three are one, in reverse order. But just in case you don't believe me that the Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, let me show you. Look, turn back there to Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Let me show you who the Redeemer is. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Here's another proof for the Trinity. They're everywhere. Just open up the book of Isaiah and at random pick a verse. More than likely, you found a proof text for the Trinity. They are all over the place. Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, there's Jehovah, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, there's Jehovah again, Thus saith the Lord and thus saith the Lord. The Lord, the King of Israel, the Lord, His Redeemer. You see that? There's the two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Word. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Here you have the Lord spoken of twice, says the Lord saying both of these things, the Lord the King and the Lord the Redeemer saying, I am the first, I am the last. Two persons of the Trinity saying, I am the first, and I am the last. You see it? There's another proof for the Trinity. But the Redeemer is God himself the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Look at Isaiah 60 and verse 16. I posted this last week's sermon on YouTube and people actually comment and say, oh, that Trinity stuff's a bunch of crap. Not not my, not not their words, mine. But anyway, they'll they'll go again, you know, say that this, this Trinity is just unbiblical. Unbiblical? I mean, I've spent two hours up here just giving you nothing but verse after verse after verse showing that it's biblical. I guarantee you that guy didn't even listen to the sermon. Just read the title and leave a comment. More than likely, he's, if he doesn't believe in the Trinity, he won't listen to an hour-long and hour long sermon on it. That's what you call answering a matter before you hear it. And that is folly and shame unto us, we're told in the book of Proverbs. Isaiah 60 and verse 16 says, Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Who's the Savior? Who's the Redeemer? The Lord. God is the Savior. God is the Redeemer. But who do we know is the Savior and the Redeemer? The Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, another proof that Jesus Christ is God. Remember what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He said that we're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from the vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. Who is the Redeemer? Christ is the Redeemer. We're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. So there, when it said, when it mentions all three members of the Trinity, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard, His Redeemer and the Lord, we got the three persons. All right. The points are getting weaker and weaker, but I still think this is interesting. Turn to Numbers 6 and verse 23. Here's a verse that just sort of hints at the fact that God is a trinity. But once you've already proven God is a trinity over and over and over and over again, then you can start looking at verses that hint at it. And I think they're kind of neat. Numbers 6, 23 through 26. Look at 
Look at this blessing that the, that the Lord tells Aaron to give. Verse 23, speak unto, the, speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Why do you suppose that he would say, The Lord, the Lord, the Lord? Maybe because God is a trinity, three persons one God. Makes sense to me. And you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw the vision of the Lord, and he saw the seraphims up there praising the Lord, and you remember what those seraphims were saying? Holy, 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 that's right. In Isaiah 6 and verse 3, it says, And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Why would they say holy, holy, holy? Why wouldn't they say holy twice or holy four times? Maybe because they were saying one holy for each person of the Godhead. Sounds good to me. And you know, they were saying that. That was about uh, 4,000 years ago or so. No, three, about 3,000 years ago, I think. And 3,000 years later, they're still saying the same thing. Look at Revelation 4 and verse 8. Revelation 4 and verse 8. This is the vision that John sees in heaven. It says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They're still singing holy, holy, holy up there. When we get to heaven, we'll be singing holy, holy, holy for all of eternity. All right, so there's your references in the Old Testament. Let's look at some New Testament references to the Trinity. Well, first of all, we have all three members of the Trinity being involved in the conception of Jesus Christ. Look at Luke 1 and verse 35. Luke 1 and verse 35. This is when the angel is announcing to Mary that she's going to have the Messiah. She's going to bear the Messiah. It says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, there's the third person, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, there's the first person, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, there's the second person, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. You get all three persons in the Godhead. You get the Holy Ghost and the Father causing the conception of Jesus Christ, who is the Word, the second person of the Trinity, made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. All three members of the Trinity were active at the baptism of Jesus. Turn back there to Matthew 3 and verse 16 again. We saw it, but let's look at it again. Matthew 3 and verse 16. In Jesus, second person, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, third person, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. First person, the Father. So you got the Father saying, I'm well pleased with the Son, sending the Holy Ghost to light upon him. You get all three persons of the Godhead in that in those two verses. As a matter of fact, I need to make a note there. I didn't have verse 17 in the outline. It should be there. Why didn't one of you catch that when I emailed it out to you and tell me? All right, anyway. And we're told there in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. And we've already seen that verse just a few minutes ago. All three members of the Trinity were active in the offering of Jesus Christ, in his offering for sin. Look at Hebrews 9 and verse 14. Hebrews 9 and verse 14. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see all three persons there? How much more shall the blood of Christ, second person, who through the eternal Spirit, third person, offered himself without spot to God, first person. All three members of the Godhead were involved in the offering of Jesus Christ for sins. 
All three members of the Trinity took part in our salvation. Look at 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. Some of you should be very familiar with this verse this week. That is, if you've started on your memory verses yet. Are you slacking? 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, first person, through sanctification of the Spirit, third person, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, second person, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. There is all three persons of the Godhead involved in your salvation. If God's not a trinity, you're going to hell because it takes all three persons to do the deed. You see, the Father elected us. He elected whom he would save. Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as he, that is the Father, hath chosen us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before us in love. So there's God's part in our salvation. God chose whom he's going to save. So there's the Father's part. And then you got the Spirit's part. The Spirit does the regenerating according to 1 Peter 1 and verse 2 there. Sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification is to make holy. That's what happens in regeneration. Whenever God takes that old wicked spirit out of you and gives you a new Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. This is done by the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the one that regenerates. So that's His part in this thing. Now Jesus' part is that He dies for them, for the, for the elect whom God has chosen, and He justifies them. Look at Romans 5 and verse 9. You see, this is, these are the three vital parts, the three first, uh, the three phase, the, fir- the three first, the first three phases of salvation are what we're talking about here. Election, and then justification, Christ dying for our sins, and then the Spirit regenerating us. The three vital parts of our salvation are accomplished by the three persons of the Godhead. Romans 5 and verse 9. Romans 5 and verse 9. says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. That's what the Son did. We were elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. God elected us to Christ's obedience. He gave us to Christ that Christ would obey God's commandment to him to go and to be the sin bearer for those people. And when he did that, he sprinkled us with his blood, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and that's how we were saved. And then the Holy Spirit regenerates our spirit, gives us a new spirit, gives us eternal life that can never die again because the sins have already been purged and put away. And lastly, all three persons of the Godhead are mentioned together numerous times in the New Testament. So I have several examples here for you, and we shall be done. Like I said, first of all, you know, I, I, I like to go with the strongest ones first and then go to some of the reference texts. Well, we know that converts are supposed to be baptized in the name of all three persons of the Godhead. Turn to Matthew 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, first person, and of the Son, second person, and of the Holy Ghost, third person. So when we baptize, when I baptize, we don't baptize, when I baptize, I baptize people in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead. The Father would send the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name, we're told. Here we go, John 14 and verse 26. Another verse which shows us all three persons in one verse. John 14 and verse 26. It says, But when the Comforter is come, third person, whom I will send unto you, second person, that's Jesus, from the Father, third person, even the Spirit of truth, second person, which proceedeth from the Father, first person, he shall testify of me, third person, or second person. There you go. You got the each one uh, referred to twice in one verse. Each member of the Trinity referred to twice 
in that very one verse. We're told in Acts 2, 33 and 34, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and has received the promise of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verses 33 and 34. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, that's Jesus Christ, second person, God is the first person, and having received of the Father, first person, the promise of the Holy Ghost, third person, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. The Lord said unto my Lord. God said unto Jesus. First and second person. So there you have it again. you got three persons mentioned there in those two verses. When Stephen was stoned, he looked up, he saw the Holy Ghost. He was full of the Holy Ghost, pardon me, he saw Jesus on the right hand of God. Look at Acts 7 and verse 55. Acts 7 and verse 55. It says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, third person, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, first person, and Jesus, second person, standing on the right hand of God, first person. There you got all three persons of the Godhead again spoken of in one verse. We're told that Paul was the minister of Jesus Christ, ministering the gospel of God to the Gentiles who were sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Look at Romans 15 and verse 16. Romans 15 and verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ, second person, to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, first person that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, third person. And one more, this will be the last verse of this sermon. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 14. This is Paul's benediction that he gives when he's finishing up this letter to the Corinthians. And I think this would be a good benediction, a good finish to this sermon. So let me recap the sermon before I read this final verse. So we got the Trinity, who is three persons, one God. The Father's God, the, Holy God, or the, the Word, who is Jesus Christ, is God. The Holy Ghost is God. Those three persons are all one, we're told in 1 John 5, 7, and the other verses that we saw. So we have three persons, yet one God. Now let's read 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. It says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ,